In Advent, we have prayed, oh, that you would rend the heavens, rip them apart, and come down. And in, Ad, and in Christmas, we proclaim, or perhaps we notice, that the heavens have already been ripped open. God has already come down. The God who created the world and made humankind in God's image has revealed at long last the point, which is that God should make that God's image in return. And ever since then, Christians have done a very bold thing indeed, some seeing it so bold that they that they couldn't quite bring themselves to do it, and that's to paint the face of Jesus on a piece of wood and say, that's God. Because God, for the first time, took material form. And this is not like the Greek gods or the Hindu gods that appear and do something and then disappear. It's not merely human appearance, but flesh. The word became flesh. And that's the right word to use. In Greek, the word flesh, just as it does in English, the Greek word is sarx, it can mean meat, just as it can for us. Flesh and bones real physical stuff. And the church has seen in this phrase, the word became flesh, not only meat and bones, but even more importantly, a human mind, a human spirit, and a human heart. Jesus Christ had all of those. This is no imitation human person animated by God like a puppet. This is a human being with all of the fears, all of the uncertainties, all of the anxieties that we know. Who came to a backward people and a family in that people who was not terribly well off, who had to sleep with the animals in the dirt on the first night of his life because they didn't have enough money to get a room. In this, God has shown us who God is but in a humanistic age, perhaps it's also important that we see that in this, God has shown us who we are. Both who we were always meant to be, but then who we really are. We are the image of God. We are those whose principal task on earth is to see the light that was coming into the world and then reflect it out in further blazing light. Or in a different metaphor, mirrors are made of glass. We are to become transparent through which the blazing light of the creation can be seen. This is not a moral task. It sounds like, well, and we do that when we're all really good people. But that cheapens it. Because our vocation is not just to be really good people. I mean, I'm all for being good. It's better than being bad. But the point is not that that's what God came to do. The point is that we are already the kind of people we need to be. We are already redeemed. God has already 
ripped open the heavens and come down. We have already been baptized. We don't need to keep preparing for our baptism one more time. What needs to be done has been done. Our job description, at least the first half of it, couldn't be easier. We're not here to white-knuckle our way into moral purity. We're not here to beat our breast and moan our sad condition. And I dare say, probably no one came to church this morning wanting to do that. Sometimes it's right and proper to do that, but we'll save that for Lent. It's a few months off. Today we reflect on what has already been done and who we already are. And that's the easiest job description there is, simply be yourself. But be the true self that God created you to be. Be transparent. I've become in love with that word, transparent. Because it implies clarity. It implies that we can be seen through, that we do not have guile, that we are not trying to be crafty. We're not playing politics with things. We're not working an agenda or behaving strategically. We are just being who we are as truly as we can. Now we know that human beings, well, I know that human beings, at least speaking of the one I know best, which is me, can have all kinds of self-deception going on. So while it sounds easy to just be who I am, I can really get myself in a knot, even confused about, well, is this me or is this a play acting that I'm doing? And I imagine most people have the same kind of problems from time to time. But I would say that the way to address this is not to turn yet more inwardly in an act of pious navel-gazing, but to turn outwardly. Because if our task is to be transparent, the measure of transparency is whether we can be seen through. Can we be seen through? If God is going to shine through us, that's so that God can then go shine through someone else. And if we are perfectly transparent, the love passes from person to person, never diminished at all. So I know that I'm being my true self. I know that I'm being transparent, that the light is finally shining in the darkness, that the darkness is not overcoming it. I know that when I see God's light shining on those around me. That's when I know it. And that implies, implies a task which is harder than just being yourself. That implies seeing others as their true selves. the person who was going too slow in the left lane as I drove here this morning. In my mind, that person was reduced to a single fact, not in a sufficient hurry and shouldn't have been in that lane. But I'm pretty sure when I reflect on that, that God's image of that person is a little different. I'm sure God cares about the traffic laws, but I'm also pretty sure it's nowhere near the top of God's list. 
And I'm pretty darn grateful that if God cares about the traffic laws, God doesn't judge me by my compliance either. <laughs> now, we live in Los Angeles, and traffic is a fact we all have to deal with, but you know, it isn't just about the traffic laws. It's about all of the rules and boundaries we set up. Sometimes they help the light shine, but sometimes they don't. And they must all always be judged by that one question. Is this making more light or less? Am I more transparent or less? Am I seeing God or not? That's the only question we need because it's the only question God is asking. At the end of time, when the angels come and gather in all of creation, God will hopefully see us all perfectly transparent, clear and crystalline, each reflecting and transmitting the light of creation, the light that shines in the darkness and which has never been put out. In Revelation, we have the tale that in the New Jerusalem, there's no need of sun or moon because God will be the light. But there's no need of light bulbs and candles either because we will do the job of reflecting and transmitting that light to each other. <laughs>